that's my company, investigating software. Um, my talk, practicing uh, test architecture. I'm going to be talking about my laptop's going to salute. Oh. That's going to be fun. Um, we're talking about how. Sorry, I've lost on my screen here. How you focus um, your testing approach rather than talking about infrastructure or agile methodology. I'm thinking about how you focus your testing to bring out more information. So essentially, you find more bugs earlier. Now, I've got a quick question before I do much more of this. Um, who here considers himself a tester? Few. Who considers themselves a, pro, a programmer or a developer? Yeah. Who considers themselves sort of a bit of both and maybe a bit of DevOps and something else as well? Yeah. <laughs> okay. And who didn't put their hand up at all? Quite a few. Uh, <laughs> cool. Yeah, recruitment consultants can't put their hands up. <laughs> okay, that's cool. Um, so yeah, I'm a self-employed consultant. I'm currently working with BP. I've worked with a few other big companies and startups in the past. There's my blog, there's my Twitter. Um, recently, I've been working with more bigger companies like BP and Sky before that. Um, as a kind of test lead and now a test architect, basically allowing them to kind of integrate test automation into their um, continuous integration process, but not completely kind of head first into test automation, trying to make sure that they're still doing exploratory testing, still finding bugs early on, and not neglecting those issues by just being blinkered in one approach. Uh, and it seems to be there's, there's a bit of a gap for that, actually. There's a lot of people that are all or nothing, you know, all exploratory, i.e. non-automation, or all scripted automation and nothing in between. Okay. Okay, so why did I say the word practicing? Basically, testing isn't a solved problem. We all make mistakes every day as testers and developers. Um, we're constantly improving like, like doctors are, like me medical clinicians. It's not a solved problem. We need to practice it every day. We're performing it in front of people. We're doing it for a purpose. We're pretty much not, hopefully, following a religion. We're not, we haven't got the agile Bible there and we're reading it religiously and don't care about reality, I'm reading the damn Bible. Um, we take into account real worlds, what our company's limitations are, regulation, you know, the time involved, do we have to release daily, hourly, you know, every sprint, we have to take those into account. It's not a textbook that we can follow. Uh, and hopefully we're not evil, uh, hopefully we're actually doing it for good purpose, we're helping our companies. Um, I've broken this down into the three isms of um, software test architecture. These are probably things you've been told or you've seen or you've read about and you think, you know, that seems sensible, you know, I should do that. Why not do that? That's, that's cool. But then when you think about them, you start to think, maybe it's not true. Now the first one is polygonism, as I call it. You've no doubt seen this. I think this is from Martin Fowler, ThoughtWorks. You go to any agile testing website and you'll see variations on this theme. Um, let's do a few UI tests, a few sort of middleware service ones and lots of unit tests. Now, that's not actually bad advice, really. That generally tends to be quite right. But it's talked about in the Bible sense, right? As in, this is a religion, you have to do it like this. Well, you don't, right? I mean, all your companies where you work have different problems, okay? you may have 90% of the logic in the UI layer. When I was at Sky, we had a lot of logic in the UI layer, and a lot of logic that couldn't really be tested manually had to be automated. So a lot of my work there was incorporating appropriate test automation direct into the UI of their uh, set-top box apps, or some of their apps. Um, and in that case, you're kind of skewing it up here, right? You've got your polygon the other way around. But it worked, right? That's what they needed. Um, if someone gives you some code, a third party, I think you mentioned earlier, and you, you don't trust them, basically. They, they don't have a good track record, but you have to use them. Well, you know, you'd focus your tests there. You'd get a team on that. You have some automation on that. You don't follow the Bible. You use what reality calls. 
Um, some companies have strange requirements, like they can be down, but if there's a message missing or they don't have an advert on the page, that's catastrophic. Uh, years and years ago, uh, I worked for a startup called lastminute.com. Anyone heard of that? Yeah? And it was a pre-IPO, and they had huge numbers of visitors to the site, but not many people were actually buying stuff because it's still a new thing. It was like 1999. They all wanted to come and see what it was, find a holiday, and a lot of the holidays would actually be booked over the phone. So you'd do your search, narrow down your criteria, and then there'd be a phone number. So DB outages happened all the time, and they weren't good, but they were much more concerned about whether the actual flat text of the website was there, whether it was easy to read, could be read in all the browsers, people could get to the phone number and call up and book their holiday. The same thing with compliance. Uh, you only have to look at things like PPP. If you, know, if you don't have your uh, appropriate option saying that you may not need this insurance, you could be liable for hundreds of millions down the road when someone says, oh, they didn't say I didn't have to have the insurance. Um, and this one here. If you don't know where the bugs are, how do you know this is the right shape? Okay? Truth is, no one knows where the bugs are. You don't until you're testing. That's why you're testing, right? You might want to test a bit of everything. Test, you know, the risk areas that you know about. And then focus your testing there. And then think, oh, actually, yeah, I need to put a lot of stuff in the API layer. UI is too brittle. I don't have a good interface there. So... Risks, like I just mentioned, focus on your risks. The sensory homunculus, it's not easy to say. Uh, this is a model of the human body where they've enlarged um, areas that have the most nerve endings. So you may have noticed your hands are very sensitive, face, mouth, eyes. I think this is the child-friendly version. Um, <laughs> your testing needs to be like that, right? Again, like I said, not uniform. You want to have the most tests in the riskier areas, in the areas that you know are going to be broken. Also, you're beholden to a product owner or a third-party company. They may have particular concerns about something. You need to speak to your customer, find out what their perceived risks. It may be that this thing isn't actually that risky. But if they're saying, you know, oh, we really don't trust this thing, widget X, that's dangerous. You know, put some extra risk uh, assessment there put some more testing there, and you'll reassure your customer, okay? It's not maybe the best reason from a kind of test point of view, but if it makes your customer happy and they feel confident that, yeah, actually, it's well tested, we're going to give you that money, and that's what you want to do, right? And you're thinking about the costs of those different approaches, okay? Going back to the polygon from before, the pyramid, um, Gareth mentioned... UI tests, they're brittle, and they can be pretty high costs, high maintenance. You've only got so much time. Time costs money. You've only got so many people. You've only got so many virtual machines. Okay? It may be great. You may need to do lots of UI testing, but again, if it costs a fortune, you can't do that. Right? You've got to balance these things. So, I know I'm laboring the point a bit. Less pyramids, more exploring. Uh, this is actually a map of Captain Cook's uh, journeys around the world. Pretty much, he didn't have a pattern. <laughs> he kind of went around in circles here a bit, went over here, came back here, got murdered here by the Hawaiians. Um, but uh, does anyone sail here? Anyone go sailing at all? No? Oh, well. No. Um, I do go sailing now and then. And if you get an old map of the Pacific around this area, you'll see actual lines marked on there where Captain Cook went and he measured the depths in all these places. And basically, he did so much exploring around the world that until the advent of modern um, radar imaging from satellites and where they can measure the depth from orbit, they didn't have depths for these regions of the world. These 150-year-old values from his uh, tours around the world were what still use, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. So, exploring, looking for things you didn't expect. Okay? This isn't a good headline to have if you're a fintech company. Okay? 
um, by exploring, looking for things you didn't expect, questioning assumptions, you can hopefully find these sorts of issues earlier. Okay, if you look, oversight around assumptions of who would be able to communicate with the card. This card is basically sort of a, a mini computer. Instead of just being one credit card, it's all your credit cards. So if you've got you know, a Visa, a MasterCard, uh, American Express, they're all on this card. And you go into your restaurant and you pay your bill and you can say, oh, use the Visa card today. You know? Turns out, like most software, like most computers, if you don't have physical access to it, you can make it fairly secure. But if you have physical access to that card, it's usually trivial to hack. And that's pretty much kind of a standard security statement. If someone has physical access to your equipment, all bets are off. And what do you do with a credit card? You go to the waiter, you know, pay my bill, he walks off down the back. Could be 10 minutes he's there, got to hack your computer, your card, and take your uh, details, which is exactly what this uh, researcher did. Proved, basically, it was joke security on the card, because they just hadn't thought how people are going to be using this. They hadn't questioned that. Full stackism. Okay. People use GUIs, machines use APIs. People are very good at examining user interfaces of apps. You only have to have you know, any modern mobile phone, modern React website or React app, and you'll see they're beautiful, okay? Lots of fine features. Now you can do some of that testing automatically. You can say, have they gone through the purchase process? Check. But if you give that to an actual, actual customer with just that, it could be completely unusable. It could be you know, unable to find the buy button, for example. So that sort of stuff is generally more people friendly, easier to test by people in detail. But API level, uh, my current role, VP, I'm doing pretty much full time API automation and exploratory testing. You can do so much, okay? You can do a lot. You can build up a set of um, API calls that allow you to build a whole suite of tests, testing a whole system. And you can use those as well to write custom scripts to explore the data, find out you know, edge cases. Basically, when you come to this level with people, adding an extra layer of software is generally a bad idea. When it comes to API level, building your own software to test the API adds. It gives you a greater benefit. So here's an example of the uh, modern UI. Oh, good, it's animating. I was worried about that. Um, if, yeah, I think the connection maybe isn't quite fast enough, but this slides beautifully to here. If you look in the background here, you can see it's semi-opaque. Okay, these icons here, when you see this fast, um, they gradually appear like this. Okay, this actually shrinks as well, this panel here. Now, all these features are things the product owner said, oh, this is what I want. They've gone to their graphics designers and requested this feature. The way that little circle appears there when you click on it, that's what the product owner wants. That's what the customer, when they feel it, thinks, oh, this is a quality application. They don't know that you know, the bank behind it's gone down or you've lost all your records. It looks beautiful. They think, wow, my new iPhone is amazing. I've got this amazing app. Okay? It gives them the feel of quality. Like those um, when the Japanese started building um, luxury cars back in the 70s and 80s, Lexus, for example, um, they went to Germany, they flew the engineers over to Germany and say, you know, we can build reliable cars. We built the most reliable cars in the world at the time. But nobody will buy our expensive cars. So they went to Germany and they spoke to the engineers and the engineers were like, ah, oh, right, yeah. It's, when you close the door, it's got a FUD. You can't just sort of click in place, okay? And when you sit in the seat, it's got to sit in a certain way. You've got to lean back, you know. You've got these middle-aged men like me that like to feel they're in a big car, you know. When you click a switch, you can't just, it's got to be like smooth and there's got to be leather furnishings and the whole approach gives the feeling of quality. And you couldn't, for example, automate that stuff in the real world and it's very difficult to automate it 
automate the tests for it in software. Is that working? It's not. Anyway. But there are many situations, so I don't, I don't want to push you all away from UI automation. It is very useful. I have done a lot of that as well, and it can really, really save you sometimes. Uh, analytics, for example, if you're a startup company, you might really not be able to have that many customers. You might not have the marketing capability, but you want to check the customers you do have, what are they doing? Okay, did they actually click on buy or did they just click on one of the adverts and go somewhere else? Without good analytics, you're not going to know that. You're not going to know where they went in the purchase flow before quitting. Which of the menu options did they click? Um, especially if you've got a complicated application, you may know they clicked on certain things with kind of regular analytics. But if you want to know the actual order they went through in the site and what decision maybe they made to not buy your product, you'll need quite detailed analytics. And UI automation can be really good for checking that. Okay? Because to check a whole bunch of different flows in UI on every CI commit, and then check a bunch of analytics calls that probably happened you know, within a few seconds, is quite tedious and quite difficult to do by hand. So you can quite easily use something like Selenium or any of those sort of browser automation tools, depending whether you're using you know, an app or a website drive that user input and simultaneously have something maybe proxying those calls at the back end and picking up, oh yeah, they clicked on this and this and this, and then they left the site. Okay? Um, one of my customers essentially has taken a spreadsheet of detailed you know, geophysical data and they're putting it online. There's hundreds and hundreds of fields of this data. You can't manually check all those things. So, if we're not looking at the beautiful interface, we're just thinking, did the data actually go in? Did it stay in the database and then come back out next time they went there? Again, UI automation to make sure it went through all the levels of the, levels of the app to the database and back out again. That's what you want to use. And simple, just CI checks. Um, did it actually you know, allow them to make a purchase on every commit? You want to know that, right? You want to have the red flag when it's just not good enough to continue. One common problem. Um, who's ever faced this when they've been told, oh, we, you know, we've got to automate this. Can we access the API? Uh, no, no, we can't do that. No one had that? You're lucky. Uh, <laughs> a few years back, uh, I won't mention the name of the company to save them some embarrassment. Very powerful uh, editorial application. Um, great user interface, but there's very complicated API underneath. And it, the web-based user interface was actually an app, really. It wasn't really a web page. Um, was so enmeshed with the back end, there weren't clear AP, separated API calls. It wasn't really restful. Bits of code might be sent back, mixed up with HTML, and oh, it's horrible. It's horrible. It kind of resembled this. And one of the reasons why, oh, you know, we've got these hundreds and hundreds of uh, UI tests. Why, why, uh, why is there such a problem? Why are they so flaky? Well, you know, you haven't separated out the stuff you can do from the UI and the stuff you can do in the API layer. And they were like, yeah, well, we can't. That's just not where the way app is. Well, that's your first bug in that situation. Your app isn't architected correctly in a way that makes it testable. Essentially, testability is one of the features you have to build into your application so that you can test it to find other bugs. It's a sort of a virtuous circle, if you get it the right way around. It allows you to uh, check for that. Randomism. This is the third, I think, isn't, and final. OK. Um, so BDD, TDD, ADD, ATDD. Um, they're good for defining your application. Who uses, say, Cucumber or RSpec or something like that? Yeah, fair few. Is it Jbehave and there's others now? Um, they're good if you want to define what your application should do. Okay, what is the behaviour? Okay, and they're fundamentally development methodologies. Uh, 
So that's good. You want to know if you've actually delivered a feature. You want to know if that feature still works in some way. But what if you want to know, you know, what you don't know? What if you want to know if it's easy to hack? What if you want to know if it doesn't work when you switch your phone sideways? Um, unless you know in advance when you're speaking to the product owner, pro product owner or before you actually have the app in front of you, what the bugs are going to be, then you can't write the scenarios, you can't do the fixtures, you can't have the, um, the testing happening in an automated fashion or scripted fashion earlier. So they're great for defining your application, they're a development methodology, but they're typically not too great for actually testing, for finding out unknowns. So, okay, quick question. Pick a number, it's five, ten, okay? Everyone picked a number in their heads? Okay. What was your number? Two. Okay, your number? 21. Yeah. How many people chose 24,212.4? Not many. I think hand briefly popped up at the back there. <laughs> okay. One thing that's often missing, and I think it, it's an easy feature to implement. Um, if you can do one purchase in your continuous integration process, you can do 100, you can do 1,000, okay? If you can do pretty much any sort of scripted test once, you can do it several dozen times. It gives you multiple advantages. You can randomly choose your test data. Um, often, you can engineer and find out, you know, build your own Oracle and find out what the correct result is. You don't even have to always do that. You can just say, oh, I'll put in any data and see if it errors. In theory, no data I put in should cause an error. Um, but say if you're doing like this simple sum, A divided by B equals C. Now, this was an actual um, feature of uh, an application I worked on. User had to enter several numbers. Uh, and one of the kind of subsets of that, well, they had to enter one number and another number. And then the application, when they click save, would just present the result. Now, it's kind of trivial, right? And if you go in manually, you type, you know, oh, 10, 5, works, you know, gave me 2. What we found is when we put some random, in, random inputs in there and started off with 1,000, um, picked floating point numbers, so uh, decimal numbers, um, between 0 and I think 100,000, we found several bugs. Now, they could have been to do with, well, they were to do with how the back end stored those numbers. It couldn't handle floating point precision beyond a certain level. How it was transferred to the, to the client. So the JSON itself could only support, in this case, I think it was double precision. Uh, but the back end was supporting much greater precision than that. So it could have, you know, many dozens of numbers behind the decimal point. But by default, I don't know if you know, but JSON um, supports double if you use standard JavaScript. So it can't support huge long floating point numbers. Um, and there were several other issues to do with the numbers going back and forward in certain situations. It might use big decimal and others you'd use double and there was just like a whole host of bugs related to that. And we wouldn't have found them if we just picked a number out of our head, two, 21, whatever, put it in there. Because as people, we're not particularly good at guessing numbers and guessing randomly, okay? And not just numbers, words, picking things from a list. If you've got a user interface where you've got, say, 10 things they can choose from a drop-down, you could write a test for each one, or you could write a test for one, or you could have it just randomly choose 100 times something from that list, or not choose from that list, and see how it behaves, okay? This helps you avoid avoid the anchoring bias. When I asked you for the number, I mentioned a couple of numbers first, okay? Now, subconsciously, a lot of you would have gone, oh, right, he said five, therefore my number should be two. You know, you didn't think, oh, it should be, you know, uh, imaginary number or, you know, floating point number. You subconsciously were anchored to the numbers I said. And so your guesses, your, your own numbers, tended to be around that area. Also, people confirm subconsciously what they expect to see. Oh, it should divide these numbers like this and present the number. 
I'll type in some numbers that do this. If you pick random numbers, you don't have that problem. It takes that away from you. You don't have that responsibility. And you'll usually find that the random numbers don't actually behave how you'd think they were. There's usually bugs in there that the developer, for example, the programmer, didn't anticipate because, again, they thought up some numbers, wrote it in their unit tests, seemed to work. Yeah, lack of imagination. We're people. We're not particularly um, great at just imagining bugs that we've never seen before. We don't know what we're imagining, so we don't do it. So if you get the computer to, computer to do it for you, it's often a lot easier. Uh, as you may have been uh, noticing, I'm, my general theme has been architect to learn. So don't just do scripted tests that aren't going to give you new information. Try and focus it around learning new information. Okay? Now, you've all seen Jurassic Park, yeah? The movie? The original Jurassic Park book by Michael Crichton had a great software bug in it. Uh, when they built the theme park, um, I think the guy, the character's name in the movie is Dennis Nidri. He's like the, the computer hacker that built the whole system. And he had a check, okay? And the check counted how many dinosaurs there were in each pen. And one day the guy goes in there and says, you know, we think there's, you know, dinosaurs escaped. You know, and it, he looks on the screen and it goes, beep, 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 you know, old style computer screen. And it's like, nope, look. Green tick next to all the pens, all the dinosaurs there. There's 10 in this one, there's five velociraptors here, all in their pe pens. It turns out there was a bug in the code. Or at least they didn't realize it was a bug. What it was doing, it was counting up until the uh, amount it expected to be there. So they typed in, oh, there's five velociraptors in there. So when it counted the dinosaurs, it got to five and went tick. He didn't keep going and say, oh, there's six, there's seven, there's eight. You know, there's more dinosaurs, and they're out killing people and eating them. Okay? So make sure your tests are expansive. They're allowing you to find out more information, and they're not just green ticks saying, yep, got five dinosaurs, continue, not a problem here. Um, now, a common counter argument to this is, uh, this is uh, just ship it. I'll let you figure out what that stands for. Um, it goes back to my earlier point. Often people say, yeah, we don't need this explorer. We just need to know, you know, it's got the stuff. It's got the buy button, you know, ship it. Well, that's good. I understand that, right? You need to know if people are clicking on this sometimes more than actually selling them stuff, okay? If you have good analytics, you can find that out. And if you only really care about that analytics, that's where you focus your testing. Maybe you don't care so much about all the other stuff, the compliance, the features. If you really care just finding out what users are actually doing, don't kind of waste your testers' time and your SDET's time scripting for the features. Focus a little more on finding out what your users actually did. Put your testing effort there, and then you'll get greater feedback from your analytics or whatever method you're using to analyze how you, people are using your site. And to help you do this sort of exploratory test automation approach, um, your kind of architecture of your team should be geared towards building tools. Okay? So rather than the scripted test, like the dinosaur check, goes through checks, checks this, checks this, yeah, green tick, green tick. Start building libraries um, that you can reuse in other scripts. So things like Fixtures for Cucumber and stuff are actually useful in this sense because you do, it forces you to write kind of methods for particular test behaviors. But you can um, kind of think wider than that and think, well, could I reuse these in another tool? Okay, could I write a tool that just lets me boom, populate the database with this stuff, populate the client with this, test these things, and I could put that into scripted tests that run in CI, or I could use it to write a custom script that go through and test whole host of scenarios that I may have to manually review the results on, but I have the benefit of it being essentially 90% automated, and it just needs me or someone in my team to go in and find out the results and say, oh, actually, they're probably okay, or actually, no, this is weird, something's wrong here, there's probably a bug, I can't tell first sight what it is, but I can investigate. That's it.
Thank you.